Hello, everybody. Welcome to the last session of QIP. My name is Zahra Khanian. In this session, as you might know, we have three talks, each 25 minutes with a five minute Q&A session uh, at the end of each talk. And you can ask your questions in the corresponding Slack channel. For more questions, uh, please join the round table. Uh, you can join the round table at the end of this session where you can directly ask your questions from the speaker. The first speaker of this session is uh, Dimitri Maslow, who is going to talk about uh, quantum advantage for, computer, uh, for computations with limited space. Uh, Dimitri, please go ahead and put up your slides. All right, can you see my slides? Yes. All right, perfect. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Dimitri Maslov speaking. Uh, today, we'll be talking about quantum advantage for computations with limited space. This is a joint work with Jin Sung Kim, Sergey Bravi, Ted Yoder, and Sarah Sheldon. All of us are with IBM. And um, uh, here is also the link uh, to um, archive version of the full paper. So my talk will consist of four parts with uh, the last two parts, theory and experiment being um, uh, the longest. I will start with the introduction. Um, specifically, um, on this picture illustrated is an imaginary computational scale uh, that says that uh, uh, quantum computations can perform, a quantum computational device can perform computations beyond the capabilities of a classical computer. And obviously this is the goal uh, for the um, community working on constructing a quantum computer. And the goal is to create a device, a quantum device with comparable uh, consumer level characteristics to the classical device in terms of its cost, weight, um, power consumption and so forth. However, a device such that it solves useful computational problems faster than a comparable classical device. So obviously this goal has not been accomplished yet. And therefore, in order to show the quantum advantage, we have to restrict ourselves to restricted models of the computation. In particular, consider the well-known CHSH game, also known as the Bell's inequality, where the two playing parties, Alice and Bob, are supplied with the random bit strings S and T, and they have to come up with the uh, output bits A and B, such that exclusive four of A and B equals to the Boolean product of S and T. The S and T are uniformly distributed randomly, and no communication is allowed once the game starts. The quantum winning probability of two plus the square root of two divided by four is greater than the classical probability of two plus one divided by four equals uh, three quarters. And this gives a quantum adv advantage, a verifiable quantum advantage, obviously, because the Bell's test has been verified. However, um, the uh, Bell's test um, and the advantage by the Bell's test can be attributed to the property of quantum states rather than quantum computations. So let's take a look at a different example, example of black box computations. And there is a variety of black box computations and rigorous proofs of the advantage in the black box computational model exist. So for instance, um, uh, here is a largely incomplete list of the algorithms um, uh, relying on the black boxes. One of uh, the famous ones, uh, specifically the one that is illustrated in the picture, is the Grover's algorithm that gives a quadratic advantage over best known classical algorithm for, for finding argmax of a function implemented by the black box. And uh, uh, the kind of the criticism of, uh, of those black box computations is either they, um, they give only a polynomial time advantage and there may be limited value to polynomial time advantage um, because it's more difficult to, um, uh, to beat a classical computer if you, if you do the things polynomially faster or it solves problems that are impractical. So a third example that is much more relevant to um, my talk is imagine we restrict the time available for a computation. Can we then show that quantum gives advantage over classical? The answer is yes, 
And uh, uh, here is a set of uh, five papers that um, uh, positively answers this question. Uh, this is, a, as you can tell by the dates, um, this is a fairly recent development. So what we do in this work is rather than focusing on time or otherwise depth of the computation, we restrict the space available for the computation. And we take a look at what happens if this is the computational model. So specifically, we consider computations where input is a read-only memory. Uh, the computations um, are specified by the two input gates where one of the inputs is a primary input and to the gate. And the other input is the computational bit. And we use a single computational bit of space. So this is how a classical circuit would look like. And this is how a quantum circuit would look like. Our goal in this work is to establish the advantage theoretically as well as validate it experimentally. So we would like to accomplish both, which goes in contrast to the work on the um, uh, depth restricted computations where uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, it has not been verified experimentally because the number of qubits required to verify it experimentally is large. And I'm not sure if we have that many qubits yet in practical uh, near-term uh, computers that we have available. All right, theory. To quickly review the computational model, uh, we allow the inputs to serve as controls to the unit trees. Uh, the unit trees are applied to the computational bit. They can be arbitrary unit trees. They may even be uncontrolled. Uh, how powerful is this computational model would be the first natural question. And it so happens that all Boolean functions can be computed with a single bit of space. And this was uh, known um, in this paper. So this is not new. What we do, because we want to compare near-term existing quantum computers, noisy quantum computers, to the classical computers, is we define the notion of algorithmic success probability. And it's a popular measure for uh, the, the success of the implementation of quantum algorithms on quantum hardware. So it's nothing surprising. Uh, basically, all it says is it says, uh, what is the uh, average probability of getting uh, the function to be computed correctly, assuming a random uniform distribution over inputs? Um, it is well-defined for noisy quantum computers, and it can be directly measured. So that's a good thing, because we want something that is directly measurable. Classical limited space quantum uh, oh, classical limit space uh, uh, circuits are also known as branching programs in the theoretical computer science. Uh, so here is how a, a, a classical limited space computation looks like. Um, similarly, we define uh, the average success probability. In other words, um, uh, given the uniform distribution over the inputs, what is the probability that we can compute the function correctly? So there are a couple of notes here that I wanted to highlight. The note number one is classical ASP, algorithmic success probability or average success probability, is always greater or equal than a half. And the reason for that is we can take a look at the most frequent output of the function f and create a branching program that outputs this very value. And by the virtue of that, it will be correct at least half the time. And note number two, in order to quote unquote equalize, um, um, uh, compare classical limited space computations to quantum uh, uh, limited space computations on the same footing, we allow the classical limited space computations, or otherwise classical branching programs, to have a free access to randomness. And the reason for that is, well, in uh, quantum noisy computations, uh, there are errors, they happen randomly, and what if this, uh, is a source of randomness that somehow quantum computers use to their advantage. I mean, obviously this is not the case. Obviously it's the other way around. Uh, those errors, they, uh, uh, they make the computation worse, but what if? And to account for this possibility, it's, it's not really a possibility, but to account for that, we uh, gave, um, we armed classical limited space computations with free access to randomness. And we proved that this does not improve the algorithmic success probability. How powerful is classical branching programs computational model? A partial answer is given by the Barrington's theorem. It says that uh, a Boolean function computable by a depth D classical circuit 
uh, can be implemented as a width five branching program of length two to the power of order of D. So what this means in particular is uh, functions from the NC1 class can be computed in, uh, in a polynomial, as a polynomial size limited space circuit. Um, our results, theoretical results, are twofold and formulated across these two theorems. So theorem number one says that classical ASP is separated from the constant one half by essentially the value of the maximal magnitude of the Fourier coefficient of the uh, function f. And therefore, for uh, functions f with small magnitudes of Fourier coefficients, such as, for instance, bent functions, uh, the ASP of F will be close to a half. And for quantum, the ASP equals one can be achieved by quadratic size quantum circuits. And those quantum circuits are obtained by the quantum signal processing technique. So this gives an advantage, proof of the advantage. It's one versus essentially a half. To, sh to uh, see what kind of advantage it is, let's consider a couple of um, functions. So one is the majority function. It's a fairly popular function. Uh, so I will uh, not discuss the definition. Um, the second function that we uh, consider is the second least significant bit. And literally this function is the second least significant bit of the weight of the input. Uh, taking a look at the n-bit majority function, what happens? Let's compare classical uh, perfect computations to quantum perfect computations. So if we look at the n-bit majority function and width equals two, in other words, we have one bit of space to work with, then classical ASP is polynomially close to a half, whereas quantum equals exactly one for circuit of quadratic size. And in classical, they can be circuit of any size. It doesn't help. You can't get any any further above a half than um, um, this additive uh, function. When we increase the width to uh, three and four, in other words, for width four, the logarithm of four is the number of bits, so it's two bits. It is conjectured that for polynomial size circuits, ASP stays less than one. However, ASP remains to be one for quantum, obviously. And uh, finally, if we increase width to five, in other words, we have three bits of computational space because well, logarithm five is a, a number between two and three. So we need three bits of space in order to code five different things. Then ASP equals one is achieved by a circuit of this size n to the power 5.42 um, versus quadratic size um, for quantum circuit. If we take a look at the SLSB function, then you can show that given a single bit of computational space, the classical ASP is exponentially close to a half, whereas quantum ASP equals one for a circuit of linear size. However, as soon as you increase the number of bits to two, in other words, width equals four, then ASP for classical becomes equal one for a linear size circuit. And it matches the ASP for quantum uh, and uh, the circuit size. So one of the reasons uh, we consider the SLSB is we found that for small values of N, the number of inputs, the uh, SLSB function achieves the minimal uh, theoretical ASP. And these are the um, numbers for the ASP. An interesting comparison can be made uh, between the um, uh, SLSB function and the n-bit majority function. So for SLSB function, you lose quantum advantage with the introduction of just one bit of space. However, with the majority function, it seems as if quantum advantage is still there when you compare single qubit limited space quantum computations to three bit limited space classical computations. So it seems as if replacing a single qubit by three classical bits is still not enough at uh, equalizing the complexities of the computations. All right, so another function that we considered is the inner product function. And the reason we considered it is because we were able to uh, show something nice um, 
uh, about using this function in order to separate classical computations from quantum computations. So specifically assume a simple computational model where the two qubit gates have a certain error P and the errors are independent. And let's say that uh, 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 the computation is successful with this probability. Like I said, it's a, it's a very simple computational model. We showed that as n approaches the infinity, it suffices to have p less than about one fifth in order to demonstrate quantum advantage using the AP function. In other words, if you have a quantum computer with many qubits and a very, very poor gate fidelity, entangling gate fidelity of 0 0.8, you can still demonstrate quantum advantage using this poor quantum computer versus a classical computer, versus a perfect classical computer, um, which is interesting that um, it takes so little to, to go into the space that is not reachable by classical computations. All right, so at the end of this uh, uh, section of the theory section, let me discuss the use of signal processing technique to construct quantum circuits, implementing symmetric Boolean functions. For, for this purpose, I will iterate the controlled Rx uh, sub-circuits of this kind with the uncontrolled Rz of this kind. And um, I will consider two um, different kinds of um, implementations of a unitary function, of a, of a Boolean function f by a unitary. One is a relative phase implementation. So obviously this is its definition, standard definition. And the one that I call true quantum implementation is ix to the power of f of x. So usually you would want to see x to the power of f of x, but this is prohibited by the determinant argument. Um, so we have to use the ix. If it bothers you, it suffices to introduce uh, a single additional qubit of space. And with that, you get rid of I completely by the known techniques. So the signal processing techniques, it answers the following question. It writes a unitary, target unitary as follows, and asks the question, uh, what kind of unitaries you can we implement by the alternating sequence of controlled Rx and uncontrolled Rz gates like this, um, and the answer is given by Lo, Yoder, and Chuang. In effect, it says that so long as these four conditions satisfied on uh, the polynomials A of T and B of T that represent the identity and uh, the X, uh, the indication correspondingly, then we have the implementation of the desired function F. To illustrate it with an example, suppose our target unitary U is the majority function of uh, three inputs. And then our goal is to construct the polynomials A of T and B of T satisfying the conditions of the um, low Yoder Chuang. So start with the A of T. A of T has to be a polynomial that uh, evaluates to one when we want to see the identity being computed. And we want to see the identity being computed when weight equals zero or weight equals one. So here is the polynomial. Now, the polynomial B corresponds to the points where we want our function to evaluate to one. In other words, when weight equals two and weight equals three. So here we have to evaluate to one and here we don't want to evaluate to one because here we want to see blue, we want to see the identity. So this is the polynomial. By looking at the coefficients of these polynomials, we can restore the angles in the quantum circuit. And here is the quantum circuit. It has three Rx stages. I, I draw them as um, kind of stare down, stare down, and stare up because all controlled Rx commute. So it doesn't really matter which order to draw them in. However, drawing them this way exposes an optimization. So this subcircuit with two entangling gates can be rewritten as a subcircuit with a single entangling gate and therefore the total number of entangling gates to implement the majority function is eight. Um, it's not like the majority function has been explicitly studied uh, uh, by the previous authors in the limited space computational model. However, it has been studied implicitly. And moreover, the known implicit constructions are polynomial in size and ours is as well. Therefore, a comparison to previous techniques is due. 
And it so happens that if we use the best known construction um, that is uh, available, then uh, the gate count is scales as n to the power of 5.42. And if you want to implement it as a circuit, then it needs in excess of 10,000 entangling gates. Whereas by using the signal processing technique, we obtained a circuit with 25 gates. So the difference is significant. Um, and it's given not only by the asymptotics, but also by the leading constants. Uh, one may ask the question, how good is the circuit with 25 gates? And the answer is, well, a better circuit exists that is found by other means, but not the signal processing. So there is, for instance, this 16 gate circuit that also implements the uh, five bit majority function as a limited space uh, circuit, quantum circuit. To conclude this section, let me uh, summarize the main results. The main results are uh, the theorem that says that any symmetric n-bit Boolean function can be implemented with at most 4n squared entangling gates, or 4n squared plus n, technically speaking. Uh, in certain cases, such as the majority function that has certain kinds of symmetries, we can reduce the gate count by a factor of roughly two. And in certain other cases, such as SLSB function, we can reduce the gate count substantively, specifically uh, to 4n or to 2n if the implementation is needed up to a relative phase. And this is a nice lemma because it contains its own proof, because this in effect is a circuit. The way you read it is it has four stages with n entangling gates each, one, two, three, four. And each of uh, the unitaries here represents the gate. So H Hadamard, HX Hadamard uh, negation, P phase, Pauli dagger X. And uh, each of the Hadamards is on the um, uh, ancilla qubit and it is controlled by all of the inputs. So uh, that's how you construct the circuit out of this formula. All right, so now I'm ready to describe the experiment. Um, in our circuit, the eight gate circuit implementing the majority function that I showed on the previous slide, we have two types of gates, the C0 gates, and they're fairly common in across all of the QIPs, as well as the square root of the C0. Well, they're, it's not the C0 exactly, it's C0 equivalent, let's, let's, say, let's say that to be accurate. And the square root of the C0 are implemented uh, uh, using, we implemented them using Qiskit Pulse. And it so happens that the uh, square root of the C0 is a cleaner gate compared to the C0. And uh, a single sentence explanation why this is the case is because um, uh, the interaction, the two qubit interaction is used for half the time. And the shorter the gate, the better it works. Uh, this is in the superconducting circuits and in trapped ions, at least in some of the um, uh, approaches to trap, approach to trapped ions that I'm familiar with, uh, the square root of the C0 is also cleaner than the C0, but there it is because half the power is used to implement the gate. So um, in a nutshell, square root of the C0 is a very useful gate. So we implemented our experiments on a 27 qubit machine uh, called uh, IBM Q Berlin. And these highlighted here are the qubits that we used for experiment. The largest experiment that we, uh, uh, that we ran was a seven qubit experiment for which we were able to find a, a exact threshold that we need to meet uh, by uh, uh, classical computer search. The, um, sometimes because they're not this, device has limited connectivity, we needed to insert the swap gates and swap gates are expensive. They need three C knots each. Um, therefore, the physical number of entangling operations that we had to implement uh, is thus sometimes greater than the number of entangling gates in an abstract circuit. We um, uh, ran the experiments with 8,000 shots repeated 75 times to build statistics for experimental error bars. And in fact, the error bars are so small, you barely see them on the slide, for instance, on this slide reporting the experiment. Uh, and here the X coordinate is all possible inputs uh, to the given function. The Y coordinate is algorithmic success probability. Uh, the red dotted line is uh, the classical threshold. In other words, if you draw classical points on, on this slide in this picture, then they have to average to below or at most <clears throat> this line. And everything that is on average above this line is super classical. 
it cannot be uh, reproduced by classical limited space computation. So as you can see, uh, we achieve the quantum advantage for both the five qubit um, a relative phase circuit and eight, oh no, five gate relative phase circuit and eight gate um, uh, circuit. Then here is the data for a uh, five bit function, uh, SLSB5. Oh no, it's for four bit function. So here is the data for five bit function. And it's interesting to see, for instance, here on this slide that uh, uh, the number of points close to the threshold is, is smaller than kind of on the previous slide because here we have two and, and there it is only one. And we beat a uh, classical uh, computer, not only on average, but for all possible inputs. So finally, this is the largest experiment, the six input Boolean function. And again, um, we achieved quantum advantage. And this concludes my presentation. Um, thank you for your attention. I will stop sharing. Thanks a lot, Dimitri, for your nice presentation. So here are our a number of questions that I would like to ask. There is this question but by David Gosset, and he's asking uh, when we consider a one qubit circuit uh, controlled on the output, why the number of entangling gates uh, is a relevant metric here? So is that because the experimental uh, error happens in that gates? So uh, the only case where the number of gates is irrelevant of those that I discussed is when a classical limited space computer is unable to achieve a certain ASP for any size of the circuit. Then I just don't specify the size of the circuit because it's the size of the circuit is irrelevant because you can't even achieve the desired uh, algorithmic success probability. Mm -hmm. But in all other cases, I actually I believe I specified the circuit sizes when there is a comparison to make. Okay, so in this case, uh, the number of entangling gates is the relevant mat matrix, right? Um, so firstly, we compare the ASPs. And if uh, a classical computer can't even achieve the desired ASP independently of how many gates the classical branching program or uh, what is the length of the branching program, or in other words, how many gates does the classical limited space computation use, then, I mean, it's, it's irrelevant because you can't even get to the desired ASP. As soon as you can get to the desired ASP, then it is worth comparing the number of gates because um, at least classical is able to do the computation. And for example, in the case of the majority function, uh, we can compute the majority function quantumly using quadratically many entangling gates or quadratically many gates. Let's just not specify what kind of gates. And classically, the best construction that I'm aware of uses n to the power of 5.42. So in other words, it's more than, the quantum is more than square root improvement. If we compare, single qubit limited space computations to three bit classical computations. So as you can see, the classical computations, they rely on more bits and yet they seem to be unable to cope with quantum computations. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your answer. Hmm? Uh, so there is another question you might, uh, maybe you can just comment on very shortly. There's also answer here. Uh, in the beginning of your slides, uh, you had an algorithm with classical gates. Uh, so in the algorithm uh, with, uh, that the output of the OR is always one, uh, is the success probability um, one minus uh, one over two to the power of N? Is that always true? Um, so yeah, one, I'm, I'm not sure what this refers to, but I suspect what it may refer to is uh, in one of the slides, and let me um, maybe again share my screen and show the slide in hopes that this is the correct slide to show. Um, okay, you have uh, just maybe 30 yeah. seconds to answer this. Right. Question. Yeah, so here, this, these aren't mm -hmm. just OR gates, they're arbitrary gates. And I know that this is how you draw the OR gate, but they're arbitrary two input single output gates of which there are 16 okay. possible gates yeah 
Okay, yeah, it's it's it just it, it is meant to represent an arbitrary gate, much like these boxes are also arbitrary unitaries. Okay, thank you so much. Uh huh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.